Tonight's a Salaha Puja. It was on the full moon of the Asalaha month that the Buddha gave his first talk, his first Dhamma, Dhamma teaching. Two months earlier, he gained awakening from the full moon night of Wisaka. And that, after that, he stayed there in Bodh Gaya for seven weeks, experiencing the bliss of release. And at the end of the seven weeks, he considered whether he was going to teach or not. He thought of how difficult it had been to find awakening, how subtle it was. And he was inclined not to teach, thinking that it would be just a lot of wasted effort. The Sahampati Brahma saw what was going on in the Buddha's mind, and he was concerned. After all, the Buddha had spent all that time developing the perfections to become a teaching Buddha, and here he was changing his mind. So the Brahma came down, got on one knee, and implored the Buddha, said, Please teach. There are those with little dust in their eyes. They will benefit from the Dharma. So the Buddha considered the world again and saw that it was true. There were those who would benefit. So he decided to teach. The story reminds us that after his awakening, the Buddha owed nothing to anyone. He had gained a full awakening, and he was free not to teach, which meant that when he did teach, it was totally a gift. He wasn't compelled. He wasn't forced. It was purely out of his compassion that he taught freely. Then he considered who to teach. First he thought of his two earlier teachers, the ones who had taught him formless attainments. But then he realized that they had died and gone off to the formless heavens, where they were out of touch. He couldn't reach them. So then he thought of the five brethren, those who had assisted him when he was undergoing his austerities for six years, and considered that they were near Benares in Sarnad. So he walked there. It probably took about a week. Once he arrived, today, basically, the full moon in Asalaha, which is basically the full moon in July. When they saw him coming, they were at first not inclined to receive him. After all, he'd given up his austerities, and they thought he had just decided to become luxurious. But they couldn't help themselves. As he approached, they took his bowl, they wiped his, washed his feet, but still they addressed him as friend. And the Buddha said, this is not appropriate anymore. I've gained awakening. You shouldn't address me as friend. He said, how can you gain awakening? You gave up on your austerities. He says, I found the deathless. Have I ever made a claim like this before? And they realized from his truthfulness that he was not the sort of person to make idle claims. So they decided to listen. And so he gave them the first talk, which we call Setting the Wheel of Dharma in Motion. He started out with explaining the two extremes that didn't lead to awakening. One was pursuing sensual pleasures. The other was undergoing torture, self-torture. Both of these extremes, he said, are ignoble. In other words, they're a childish approach to the question of finding true happiness. On the one hand, you follow sensual pleasures wherever they can go. On the other, you decide that if I endure enough pain, maybe the reward will be a higher pleasure, a higher happiness. But the Buddha said, no, neither extreme works. The, the path that works is the middle way. And by this he didn't mean a middling way, halfway between pleasure and pain. It was a path that allowed for comprehending suffering and using the pleasure of right concentration as an alternative to either sensual pleasure or physical pain. The right view that was part of the path was focused on the question of how to understand suffering. In other words, why is it that we suffer? Where is the cause? 
And he set forth the Four Noble Truths. This is the right view of the path. He said there are Four Noble Truths. And what's noble about the truth? It's not that suffering is noble or craving is noble. But it's the approach you take to the suffering. It's the approach you take to the cause of suffering. Seeing that the suffering is not something you're simply subjected to. It's something you're actively doing. You're clinging to the five aggregates. That's the suffering. The cause is not something outside. You can't blame it on the weather. You can't blame it on the economy or politics. It's your own craving. Specific, specifically three kinds of craving. Craving for sensuality, craving for becoming, which means the desire to take on an identity in a world of experience as a means of finding happiness. And craving for non-becoming, in other words, you have a becoming already and you want to see it ended. That craving, too, can lead to clinging and create more becoming. So those kinds of craving, the Buddha said, are the cause of suffering. What's noble about this is you realize that the cause comes from within. Again, it's the childish attitude that says, I'm suffering because of so-and-so or something outside. It's the noble, mature attitude that realizes that the suffering is coming from within. But it is something that can be changed. It is possible to abandon that craving. That's the third noble truth. And you do that by developing the path, starting with the right view and going all the way through right concentration. In other words, you take on the responsibility yourself. You train yourself. And that training is what attacks the craving, puts an end to suffering, and you can find the deathless that way. The question is, why is this talk, talk called the setting the wheel of Dharma in motion? And there are for two reasons. One is because the Buddha sets out, after explaining the Four Noble Truths, he sets out three levels of knowledge for each truth. And he goes through each truth, three levels of knowledge for each truth. In English, we would call that a table, where you set out different variables and run through all the permutations. In India, they call it a wheel. The idea being that you would imagine going around the horizon and identify this permutation with that point on the horizon, that permutation with this point. So you go three times four, you have twelve. This is why the Dharma wheel has twelve spokes. In terms of the first noble truth, the truth of suffering, the duty is to comprehend it. In other words, to understand it to the point where you have no more passion, aversion, or delusion around it. The duty with regard to the second is to abandon it. The duty with regard to the third is to realize it. And the duty with regard to the fourth truth, which is the path, is to develop it. So there are four duties. So that's the second level of knowledge for each truth. And then the third level would be to realize it you had completed those duties. That, the Buddha said, was what constituted his awakening. After hearing this talk, one of the five brethren actually had an experience. He saw the deathless. It's expressed in the Pali's Yanginchi Samudya Tamang Sambanta Nirota Tamanti. Whatever is subject to origination is also subject to passing away. Now that phrase would naturally occur to a mind that has experienced something that's not subject to origination and therefore not subject to passing away. In other words, he had a glimpse of the deathless. It's called the Dharma I because he glimpsed it, saw it, but didn't yet fully inhabit it. And that was the beginning of the Noble Sangha, which is why they say that on this night, the triple gem became complete. The Buddha was already there. He had already gained awakening two months earlier. The Dharma of Truth had been there forever. The Dharma of the Teaching also was first happened that night. And then the first member of the Noble Sangha was, arose at that night. 
So this is when the triple gem becomes complete. So it's important to think about that, that understanding suffering is our refuge. We take refuge in the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha because they have understood or comprehended suffering. They have abandoned its cause. They've realized its cessation by developing the path. We take refuge in that because we believe that that applies to us as well. If we want happiness in our lives, this is what we have to do. These are the duties. Notice those duties are conditional. The Buddha is not forcing anybody. He didn't force the five brethren to listen. But he addressed a problem that eats away at everybody's heart. It's that problem that forces us. We have to find a solution to the problem of suffering one way or another. And he provides a noble way. He provides a way that really works. That's why it's our refuge. So we're inspired by their example. And it's when we follow their example that we get a refuge inside. So we show our inspiration by recalling these events every year. We have the candle circumambulation as a way of symbolizing our respect for the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. But as the Buddha said, the best way to show respect for him is not with material things, but it's through the practice. After all, think of all those aeons that he spent trying to find the deathless. And he didn't do it so that he could get more candles and incense and flowers. He did it so that he could find a skill that was really worthwhile, that would go to the heart of the problem of suffering. And so he would be able to teach it as well. He, he had that kind of broad heart. They didn't want to solve the problem only for himself. He wanted to solve it for as many people as wanted to solve it. So that's why he said that the best way to pay homage to him is through the practice. So as we sit here meditating, we're working on one of the duties. We're working on the duty of developing the path. And is anything that comes up that gets in the way of our concentration? Well, regard that as part of the cause of suffering. You let it go. So we're building our own Dharma wheel here. We've heard about the truths. Now it's up to us to do the duties so that someday we'll find completion. Our Dharma will be complete, so we'll have twelve spokes as well. But in the meantime, you ask yourself, how many spokes does your wheel have at the moment? Do your best to add as many as you can. <laughs>